alternating and of every way of thought Cause I'm always running through circles in my head I find a new direction Gonna alternate and innovate my situation It's gonna take a change to validate my life I think it's time that I exchange All that's mine Gonna get back Get my life on the incline Yeah Go on the incline Go on the incline Yeah, yeah, yeah Go on the incline Go on the incline Go on the incline Yeah, yeah, yeah Welcome, welcome back, everyone. What a great way to start this episode is uh, with the jam sesh with Brother Rob and myself. Take these ears off. And um, just wanted to say we're going to brush past some things today that we could definitely spend more time on. So if you have a request or you want more information about a piece of gear that we use, even if it's a guitar, um, just uh, maybe leave us a request in the comments or you can send us a message. But today's episode is on Contemporary, Contemporary Worship. Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm Rob. Uh, with me is Jameson, our, uh, our newest member of the team. Uh, Jameson's probably one of the most fabulous musicians I've ever worked with. And I really, I can't say enough things about not just who he is, but his heart as well. Uh, and that is just so important with what we're trying to do here. Um, what we want to talk about first off is why do we have contemporary worship services? Um, and I can think, you know, the Bible says, sing a new song. And that's not to take away any of the, any of the glory or the, the, the beautiful hymns uh, that have been around for so long. And they're, they're so important to keep up with too. But we have to do something that's going to help us to grow, not just uh, grow in our musicianship, grow in our, in our talents that the Lord's blessed us with. And we really need opportunities to give these new songs out so that people can get different feelings and different emotions and different reactions that will maybe prick somebody's heart in just a different way to where the Holy Spirit can really do His work. That's right, Rob. The, the word that you touched on, that it, the most important word you touched on was new. So contemporary worship was, you know, different in the 70s and 80s than it was in the 90s or the 2000s. It's evolved and it continues to evolve to whereas you know, 20, 30 years ago, it was instruments like Rob and I were just playing, and, uh, and nowadays it's more of a keyboard and a computer uh, could, could create most of your sounds during worship. But uh, I grew up in a church that started with a choir, traditional choir, and singing out of a hymn book. And then when the praise and worship songs started coming out, we had a praise team that would sing in front of the choir, and that's what you might call blended worship these days. And then lots of churches you know, the, the people wanted to stay traditional, and you have people who were hungry for the new uh, contemporary music, so they have uh, both services available, uh, so you can choose, or you can go to both of them in some, in some places, you could go to both services. And both of these options are still very readily available. At the church that we're filming at right now, uh, this is the, the room that's used, it's a, it's a gym. Uh, this was converted several years ago for a contemporary service, and uh, we're going to do another episode on, on traditional services, and just a little bit down the hallway there is where they have their, their traditional sanctuary, where it has the pews, and it has, you know, uh, it's just an absolutely beautiful sanctuary. Um, but the real important thing is that these, these options, both the blended worship, the traditional services, the contemporary services, they're all readily available. Like at my church, for example, my church has a blended service because for a hundred years, my church was a choir with hymns, and then we had a church split that was really ugly, uh, and the choir got gutted. I talked about this in one, of our, in one of our previous episodes, but we really needed something to help take some of the pressure off of the choir, so we put a praise team together, um, and then we started getting a little back and forth, and it, not, not in any kind of um, 
in any kind of like venomous way, but there was a little bit of tug and a little bit of pull because you know some of the some of the the choir members felt that they weren't being used enough. So we start we actually found a way to bring them both together, and that's that's a really hard thing to do, and it's something that's not really successful very often. But when it is, it's an absolutely beautiful thing. Yeah, well, it's all it's there's it, new is always scary, and that's the main thing. It's scary to the people who don't want to let go of their traditional. Uh, what they know, not even traditional, just what they know. Um, but, uh, you know, kudos to the churches who uh, did embrace and do embrace that, even if they want to separate it and have it separate or blended. I think blended is beautiful. Uh, that's probably my favorite um, type of worship experience is a blended worship. I myself have been exclusively contemporary modern worship for the past nine years. But uh, in the past, have done choir, and then what I like have liked to do, especially in a smaller church, is have a walk-up choir. So uh, you know, at the very beginning, you could have a walk-up choir, and you just do one song. Come up, walk-up choir, choose a song out of the book, and that way, people who may not would ever participate might might do the walk-up choir one day. And that's also another great thing is uh, choirs are also very very good at getting people to join. They're good about getting people serving. Uh, a choir really requires a servant's heart because it's a lot of dedication to it. You have to have, you know, you have at least one choir service or one choir practice during the week. And you have your choir practice in the morning before the service. It really takes a lot. Um, it's a lot different than having, say, a contemporary setup where you have, for all intents and purposes, what we have tonight. Here's a two-man rock band. Right. And everybody's, you know, playing different instruments has to be ready. Well, with a choir... Uh, everything's pretty much already set up to where they just walk in, they do their service, and then they, they leave, or they uh, either that or they sit up there for the whole service. Uh, my choir usually gets, you know, um, dismissed right as the praise team's coming down and as the pastor's coming up, uh, right before we start the message. They usually get dismissed about the same time as the children go to children's church. Right. Well, Rob, one of the benefits of having uh, the contemporary service, even if it's separate, and even if it's in the same worship space, is the flexibility of it. Mm -hmm. Choirs, not very flexible. Organist out, not very flexible. Um, so with this, we could have, uh, you know, an additional guitar player or two, a keyboard player, and possibly some people who are just vocalists and do the same exact songs um, with the same energy. And it would sound different, obviously, with the more pieces, but we, we just demonstrated how t uh, two people can bring a full sound uh, into like a uh, call to worship or a first uh, order of worship where you really want to wake people up and remind them, hey, I'm in church, you know, I need to quit thinking about the things that are outside of these doors. And uh, a good jolt to the system. So if you're by yourself, don't be afraid to jolt, you know. God wants us to wake up. <laughs> Absolutely. And one of the other things that's, that's great about a contemporary service is a lot of the songs that we do on the contemporary service, they're the songs that are played on Christian radio. Um, not to say that everything that's played on Christian radio would necessarily be a great worship song, uh, but and, and we, can, we could spend hours upon hours on that, the difference between a worship song and a praise song and, and what's really just a song to, to, to bring your attention to Christ versus a song that is there to help open your heart to worship Christ, to, to bring in the Holy Spirit, to become one with the Holy Spirit and, and get that filling of the Spirit that's just so important, especially when we're preparing our hearts to hear the Word of God. That's a very important thing, and it's something to be taken very, very seriously. It's not something to be taken lightly or flippantly. Uh, it's very important that your focus is right, that your heart, especially if you're going to be up on a stage like this, that your heart is there for Jesus, not just to be up there playing. Because it's the easiest thing in the world to spot is, is somebody who, who is in it for the music. And it's, it's something that I, having grown up in a recording studio, grew up in the, in, you know, around the rock star life. It's something that I have to battle with daily because it is such an addiction. And I hate to use that word here right. in church, but being on stage under spotlights is such an addiction. And it's something that I have to constantly be in prayer about. Lord, cleanse my heart posture my heart properly, take my ego out of the equation. And, and ev anybody that's actually sat here and prayed with me has heard me say the very same things. And it's, it's v so very important to get your heart right first, get on the stage, get the attention off of you and straight onto the Lord. Absolutely. Stay humble, keep your heart humble. And, and it is a fine line to walk between the confidence that you need to, uh, another word I hate to use, perform, uh, but perform is a word we would use to take this song and we're going to perform this song for Jesus or for you. Uh, it doesn't have to be a bad word, but the confidence it takes to do that and do it well is, is and then not be arrogant and not, not be show-offy 
uh, if that's a word. Um, it is but now. It is it now. Is now. We could put it in Webster's. But uh, I want to trace back to what you're saying about the music selection. Uh, and this, is, uh, this happened to me, specifically to me. I replaced uh, someone at a church uh, several years ago who had uh, the previous worship pastor been there over a decade. And the number one criteria in their search was the members wanted to leave worship, get in their car, and hear the same songs on the radio or on the on the satellite streaming services, but con the, in, their, in their minds, contemporary was modern, 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 like in today. So that was a big issue with me with, not issue, but my criteria changed for song selection because I had always relied on beautiful old songs. And I like to take hymns and strip them down and make an acoustic or take hymns like uh, uh, Ken, the Ken Trail guy and just make them like ah crazy stuff um, we actually do that one here uh, but when the, you uh, when you're kind of pressured that uh, you know the job the job description per se is you know songs that need that are heard on the radio then you have to kind of bring those in whether <laughs> you want to or not um, but let's talk about the different setups you, uh, Rob mentioned earlier that we're in a, uh, a multi-purpose facility which many 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 churches do and fortunately here they have a setup where it's kind of a permanent uh, stage. I've been involved in ministry where we had to set up everything um, for practice and for worship. So twice a week had to tear down and set up. That is taxing on your staff. It's taxing on your volunteers, especially if you want them to help, and they should help. Um, taxing on the body. It's taxing on the body, yeah, and then setting up the chairs. But that's part of ministry, too, and that requires volunteers, and people will put out chairs, and they'll put them back up. It's, you know, you have to, uh, that's just part of ministry, you know, finding the right people who that, they'll feel like that's where their heart is. Uh, and that's why a lot of times I would, in volunteering and recruiting uh, for volunteers, I know we're getting off subject, but a couple of times a year I would always speak to the whole church as much of it as I could about volunteers and, um, and you know, there's, there's technical volunteer jobs, and, but all of that to me is worship band. You know, worship band is the people who set up the chairs before church. Worship band can people, the people who come three hours later make sure the doors are locked. You know, they can be in work, they can be a part of worship band team um, if that's what it takes for them to feel a part of the church and, uh, and to serve, because everyone needs to serve their church at some level. And this is, and this is a, another very important thing uh, that you touched on is the importance of that. The people that come and set up chairs, they're every bit as important as the worship leader that's up here with a guitar. The people that are making sure the doors are locked, the people that are making sure that everything's, you know, set up so that people can come together and fellowship with each other and fellowship with the Holy Spirit. It's, it's, it's all service, and we all just have a different role serving God's church. Right. All right, let's get back to worship, as in worship music and worship band, and a setup like this. So probably the biggest thing you may have noticed if you're not a church goer or a regular church center, or maybe you're at a small church, is why was Rob in the aquarium? Well, the Rob, why were you in the aquarium? Uh, I was in the aquarium because this church uses a, a sonar acoustic drum set. It's an absolutely beautiful set. I've played this. I've played this drum set here countless times. I was one of the. I've been one of the drummers here for. Uh, I think pretty close to two years, and then uh, I'm, I'm a guitar player as well. Well, I try to play guitar, and I started playing guitar here, and then I kind of get called in more and more. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with Planning Center. With a worship leader here, she gets on Planning Center, and she sends out uh, invites to whoever requests to, to come and be a part of the worship team for that week. And she gets to choose where I play. Sometimes I'll play drums, sometimes I'll play guitar. But the reason that we have this soundproof setup is because these drums are incredibly loud. Um, even when I'm in here, I have to have hearing protection in because I don't want to damage my hearing. Those cymbals are absolutely shrieking loud. Yeah, drums are loud. So that's kind of the rule of thumb with mixing a room is the loudest thing, you have to mix everything to the loudest thing. So if the drum set is the loudest thing in this open room, everything else would have to be leveled up to the drums, which you could imagine how loud it would be. You can hear the echo in this empty room right now. So that's also why we have, in the past couple of decades, is killed our stage volume, even these guitar amps behind us. And the one I was playing through earlier is actually not even on the stage. It was just a pedal board is the need to, now hang on guitar players, I felt it, Rob, <laughs> I felt it. It's tugging at me. I know, I'm and I, I'm a guitar picker, 
and I love tone, and I love my vintage uh, tube amps, and I love my pedal boards, but, um, you know, we're talking about worship and what's best for worship, and I promise you probably the biggest complaint in church today is that electric guitar is too loud, um, because it needs to be loud, you know, uh, certain mixes and certain songs require that guitar to be loud, it's supposed to be loud, it's supposed to be like the lead singer coming right over that break, but... Um, I'm still on. When it's, uh, are we still in, Matt? Um, okay. All right. One, two, one, two. One, two, there it goes. Um, when, when everything is out of the cabinets, and that's what we'd call the, the box here, uh, this is kind of like what a pedal board would be. Uh, Rob has a pedal board here. But now our sound technician has full control. Um, now, that can be an issue in itself sometimes, uh, but you have to let the sound technician be in charge uh, of the sound. And if the sound technician says, hey, we don't want any volume on the stage, then you need to trust that person and learn to adapt yourself. And that's kind of a, that's kind of a me to you as a musician. If you want to be versatile and get used, you can't be a diva and demand to have things your way because you need to, well, A, you need to be uh, submissive to whoever God has put in charge at the moment. And uh, in my opinion, the sound technician is in charge of the sound. I mean, oh, absolutely. Kinda, it says it in the name. Absolutely. That's, that is, and, and the other thing is, we were talking earlier in an earlier episode about in-ear monitors. And uh, one of the things that I see, because I spend a lot of time on these forums, you know, worship leader forums, worship leader groups on Facebook. You know, I spend a lot of time on those places t- trying to get ideas for where we want to do our next episodes. And one of the things that I've heard so many times is, I can't hear myself in front of house. Well, the thing is, when, you're, when you have a good front of house engineer, he's mixing what's best for the music, what's best for the church, not necessarily what's best for Rob's ego. And I, I like to hear myself. So what I do is I just turn myself up in my inner monitors. I trust my front of house engineer to take care of the sound, to make sure everything sounds good. I, I, there, at this church, there's also a separate uh, sound engineer that only mixes the live stream. And I'm telling you, these guys have made my little cheap guitar just sing and sound so beautiful. And I, I can't stop coming up to them and saying, look, thank you for making that sound so good. Um, but it really, it, it's just a matter of trust. You have to be able to trust them. They have to be able to trust you. A lot of guitar players, they'll like to leave a little bit of headroom when the, when the sound engineer tells them, turn it all the way up. They'll leave a little bit of headroom. So if they don't think they can be heard enough, they'll turn it up just right. a little bit more. Things like that, that'll break trust. And right. that'll actually cause a lot of strife and division within the worship team. And your worship team isn't just your band. It is your sound techs. It's, it's everybody that's involved in it. So you really, you have to be very careful um, to not step on each other's toes. Uh, make sure whatever, if you have a, a legitimate concern, make sure that you approach, you know, your sound tech or your worship leader or your bass player, whoever you have this issue with. Make sure that you're approaching them with a humble heart. Um, because there's absolutely nothing that will split a worship band like like uh, just bickering back and forth. Uh, Meism. Meism, yes, Me-ism. because it's all yeah. about we, not me. Right. And uh, well, while we're on that point, uh, as a worship leader and pastor, what do you do when you have someone who refuses to give up their special amp or their sound? Uh, I've been on that road a few times, and there, you know, you don't want to lose someone a talented musician over an issue and you try to compromise you know you try to come up with solutions is what I have done in the past with baffling with uh covering an amp completely because or putting an amp in a different room that works as well as anything if you want to still have the tube amp or you've got your granddaddy's old super and you you know that's the only amp I'm going to use well you can put it in a different room and it basically get the same effect because you're killing the cab um do you want to talk about a little bit about the board that we're using in here? Uh, I know we yeah, have a shot on that. Using, here we're using the, um, the X32. Uh, it's a 32-channel um, digital soundboard. Sounds absolutely amazing. It's got a killer compressor on it. Um, I've, I promise you that even with my little pedal board, I have challenged the limits of that compressor <laughs> a time or two, and I've had the sound tech say, hey, hey, <laughs> yeah. if this, the compressor sounds great, but you're pushing it. Yeah, if the lines go further this way than they do this way, you might yeah. need to change something. <laughs> yeah, um, it's, it's a great board, it's, and they're not that terribly expensive. I mean, when you look at what an analog board co- cost 20 years ago, you can get a much better digital board that can run 
through uh, Dante, which digital audio through network something. Digital audio through network, I forget what the, what the actual acronym is. Um, there's also AS, and, and we'll, we'll toss it over to Matt right quick. He knows more about that. Yeah, talk about technical difficulties. Um, not going to go into great detail because there's a future episode to talk about it. Okay. But, uh, yeah, he's talking about the Dante and the AES technology. You can actually send in-ears over a network cable versus running multiple outputs. Um, as you can see with the shot that I'm flipping to right now, this is RX32 again. Uh, this is actually being used right now to run this mix. So you can actually see the levels and uh, how it would work in a real time thing. But we don't want to go into too much depth there. But up on stage, you can also see the uh, P16 mixers that go along with it. So all of these are elements of a contemporary worship scenario. Typically, this would be a little overkill for a traditional and a sanctuary. But we use our one for ours here because it does make for simpler setups and transitions and things like that. But anyway, I'm going to flip it back over to the guys on the stage. Well, another great thing about the... Uh Another great thing about the digital boards is you can set up scenes, and I've done this uh, with my teams where I will have uh, multiple people who actually lead worship as being the lead singer of a song. And sometimes uh, just where you're standing requires a lot of live mixing. You know, if you've just got a, a, a vanilla, a generic, uh, you know, worship scene where everything goes um, and then you got to turn Cindy up and Bobo down. For, so sometimes what we have done when, it, Rob, every time we sing, you know, all hell King Jesus, you're the lead singer. If you're, not, if, we're, if you're not here, we're not singing it. Well, then that can be saved as a scene. And that way you just switch to that song. And then you could put a lot of the uh, systems. The last system I worked with was Alan and Heath. But it would, you could make a, a set list every Sunday of the songs and you could put anyone back there and say, okay, third song, just push this button and it would pull the song up. Uh, not that uh, there's still not things that need to be live mixed, but just they will make your world easier and they actually what they'll do is they'll, unfortunately, they'll make it uh, to where one person can do 98.99% of all the, all the uh, pre-work and the setup and all that to where you can use a untrained uh, volunteer to kind of run uh, sound or lights. And or then all they've got to do is hit the go button. Yeah, I used to do training for running lyrics. I was like, can you read? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, you're hired, you know. Can you, can you click the mouse? Well, you're trained, you know. <laughs> and then if they want to learn how to build a pro What's that? To run the lyrics, can you handle people staring at you? With <laughs> you're right. Stare? <laughs> right. We should have an episode on the fake volume slider. Oh, you I always love need the fake a, volume You always need it's a, a fake. Thing. I like to use a lighting board. And it's like, the drums are too loud. How's that? Oh, so much That's better. That's great. Yeah, <laughs> I just turned the reds off. <laughs> All right, we're joking, we're joking. Uh, what else did we want to cover? We've covered a venue. We've covered setup with different musicians. Uh, we've covered some of our equipment. And what, like we said before, if you want specifics on these, just, sh uh, you know, give us a shout. And we will try to do, uh, you know, any kind of uh, equipment um, demo that, uh, that you want. We'll try to, if we don't have that equipment, we'll try to find it so we can demo it for you. And not only that, the, another quick thing that we just want to grow into really quick, the reason for all of this, the, the personal mixers, the monitors, um, this church, and you probably recognize this setup because I was standing right over there when we did our episode on multi-tracks. So we're able to run multi-tracks straight into our ears because of these little mixers. Um, and we do it in a live setup. Um, well, while we're doing live worship, it's filling in the sound. There's a lot of pads. There's a lot of, you know, extra instrumentations, things that just fill out the sound and make the sound almost sound like it's coming off the walls and from all different directions. And it's just, it's a beautiful thing. That's when I've, 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 I've literally stood up here on this stage and cried in the middle of worship because it was just, I could feel the tugging on my heartstrings. Right. Well, uh, Rob and, and everyone who's watching, as much as worship can be an opener to the heart, it can be a distraction and a closer to the heart and the mind and the spirit. If things are too loud or shrieky, uh, you know, it can, it can make people leave, you know, altogether. But it can definitely uh, close people off to where they were heading is thinking about God or thinking about whatever, getting their minds ready for the scripture and the, uh, and the word. So um, lots, lots of little things, but most of it's just common sense yeah, you know just good old common sense requires a lot of that right
Well, do you want to uh, play a little more yeah, before let's, we let's play head out? We're going to switch over to a, uh, so we started uh, with a kind of a, what I would call a call to worship, like a first song, something that really gets people's attention. Um, and then uh, towards the end or the end of the service, we'd maybe do something more softer, which we're going to do now in utilizing the electric guitar again, but with a softer setting and the keys over there. And this is all running through my Line 6 Pod Go. It's, um, it's basically a baby helix. It's a real, uh, it's a real common uh, pedal board, and it's an amp modeler, and I'm playing through a Vox AC30. Always remember to tip your waiters and waitresses, and check your batteries. <laughs> 